Well, our, uh, our speaker this morning is uh, a good friend, someone I really admire and uh, respect. Um, he's lead pastor at Christ Presbyterian Church in Santa Barbara. Uh, Kyle Wells uh, is from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the birthplace, and this, these are his words, of rock and roll. Home of the blues, where Elvis is king, Jesus is lord, and barbecue is spicy. And I'm here to say there's not a, not a place you can go in Santa Barbara that's like barbecue in Memphis. Uh, now, he says this upbringing has uh, deeply influenced his love of food, music, and Jesus. So uh, he went on to get his PhD from Durham University where he studied the dynamic and transformative aspects of grace. Uh, he, do, he does believe, however, his greatest achievement in life was to uh, persuade his wife, Pam, to say yes to him uh, some years ago. And they have a daughter who looks a lot like him, which kind of scares him and makes him proud. Anyway, uh, Kyle Wells is a fine, wonderful man, a great preacher, and uh, really worth your time. And uh, Kyle, I'm so glad you got, we got you here. Uh, come on up and uh, tell us about the Lord. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh -oh. You can find that barbecue at my house. So, turn to Luke, if you have a Bible, Luke chapter 2. As you're turning there, I'd like to remind you that it's Advent. Advent means coming or arrival. It's a season in the church calendar where we think about the coming of Jesus Christ. It's a time to cultivate hope, uh, longing, expectation. I wonder, what are you hoping for this morning? I would imagine that most of you are hoping to get through this semester, get through your finals. I, uh, when I was sitting in your seat, I used to play this album. It's so amazing. Counting Crows, Recovering Satellites. And there is a song on that album called Long December. It's been a long December and there's reason to believe maybe this year will be better than the last. And, uh, and I used to think, it's been a long semester, and there's reason to believe maybe this coming semester will be better than the last. What are you hoping for? I would imagine that actually what you're hoping for deeply is for God to show up in your life. To be convinced that he is with you and for you and that he loves you. And that's true whether or not you are, consider yourself a Christian or not. See, even those of us here who don't consider ourselves to be Christians, we're still wanting to know, God, do you exist? But more than that, what we want to know is, do you exist for me? Are you with me, Lord? Are you for me, Lord? Do you love me, Lord? Me. Advent's a time where we cultivate hope and longing, uh, and usually we do it by looking to the first coming of Jesus as we think about what it might mean for him to show up a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time, or an ultimate time. So let's look at Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed. Who is with child? And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. This is God's word. Let me pray for us. And I ask that faith might come by hearing. And hearing from the message of Christ. It's in his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Well, verse 1 begins by telling us that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Caesar, it's not the name of a famous guy that liked salad. It actually is a title for the Roman emperor. Because at that time the Jews were ruled. They were ruled by the Romans. That was actually not a... Um, not a new thing for Jews. They had been ruled by foreigners for some 500 years. First it was the Babylonians, and then the Assyrians, and then the Greeks, and the Seleucids, and the Ptolemies, and then the Romans. They knew what it was like to be ruled by a foreign people. But if you want to know something of the inconvenience of this rule, then you can look in verses 3 through 5, where Mary and Joseph have to, in late-term pregnancy, travel quite some distance. It was a particularly oppressive state, an oppressive state because, because to, be, to be ruled by a foreigner meant that you weren't ruled by God. You see, their scriptures had told them that if they were to break the covenant with God, then he would hand them over to a foreign nation, to a foreign power. So to be ruled by the Romans was to be God forsaken, God Abandon. But at least the Romans, at least they had um, a peaceful rule, the Pax Romana, and they had a particular way of keeping the peace. They would take insurrectionists and they would strip them naked, mock them, beat them, take two pieces of wood, put them together, and then they would hang the insurrectionists on that piece of wood. Crucifixion, it was called. And that's how Rome kept the peace. It was, a, it was an execution so gruesome, so humiliating, so filled with shame that, well, Romans wouldn't let their own citizens be crucified. But you know who could be crucified? Jews. Thousands upon thousands of Jews. Ancient historians tell us sometimes up to 500 in a day, Jews were crucified. And crucifixion, it was a particularly painful form of death to a Jew, not simply because of the extremity of it, but because their scripture told them in Deuteronomy 21, the one who is, hangs on a tree is associated with the curse of God. And so, if 500 years of rule wasn't enough to convince Jews that they had been God-forsaken, well, crucifixion drove the point home. I wonder if you can relate. Not necessarily to crucifixion or foreign rule, but to feeling God-abandoned and God-forsaken. Some of you have come into my office and I've heard your stories, stories of suffering and pain and tragedy and loss that what well, makes you wonder is, God, are you with me? Are you for me? Do you love me? I have a daughter named Neve. Um, don't ask about the name. She is five, and she's a great joy to me. Uh, my wife and I spent a lot of years and a lot of money trying to have her. When she was um, six weeks old, uh, six weeks, um, my wife was six weeks pregnant. We almost lost her. I almost lost both of them, but God saved them both, brought them through. Now, after that, we continued to try to have children, but we have been unable, except for a couple years ago. My wife conceived again for the second time. We were so happy. We had given up the hopes of having another child. And then, when she was 11 weeks pregnant, we lost that child. 
I still weep about it today. We felt cursed by God, abandoned by God, forsaken by God. Are you with me, God? Are you for me, God? Do you love me, God? Well, that's no doubt how the Jews felt. But they did have a hope. They weren't without hope. You see, their prophets, prophets like Isaiah, had told them that one day, someday, a Messiah would come from the line of David. And this Messiah would, would rule the nations and would restore Israel. We hear about this hope in verse 10, the good news that's announced to the shepherds. That one would come born from the house and lineage of David, a Savior who is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, Lord. The same title that Caesar applied to himself. In other words, this person would rival Caesar and outdo him. And he would bring, of his, king, of his kingdom, there would be no end. And it would mean righteousness and justice and deliverance. And the Jews, they knew just what to expect. They knew just what to expect. It meant retributive justice. When, when the Messiah would come and he would break the Gentiles with the cross... Crucifixion, because that's what they had done to the Jews. It was punishment fit the crime. They knew just what to expect. It was retributive justice. It was distributive justice. The spoils of the Romans that they had taken off the backs of the Jews for so long, they would go to the Jews. In other words, they knew what it was going to be like. It was going to be, it was going to be a time of health and wealth and prosperity. And is it so different than our expectations of what it would be like for God to appear, for him to show up in our lives? I mean, what would it look like for God to appear in your life to show you that he was with you, that he was for you, that he loved you? Maybe it's a, a job out of school. Maybe it's getting into that grad school of your dreams. Maybe it's the scholarship coming through. Maybe it's that relationship that you longed for and hoped for. Maybe it's new friends or better friends. Do we really look for something that's so different than what the Jews would have been looking for? I mean, just think about how we use the term bless. What do we mean when we say bless? Bless. I'm really blessed. Where do we apply that term? Don't we apply it to the wins in life? Don't we apply it to places like when we get, um, when we get health and wealth and, and prosperity? See, we know what story to expect. Like the Jews, they knew what story to expect. But Luke, he tells a much different story. Verse 6. He says, and while they were there, the time came for them to give birth to a son. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The first place in which this story differs from the story that they expected is in actually where he appeared. Verses 5 and 6 talk about places like Nazareth and Bethlehem. Now, we expect the Messiah to arrive in a place like Jerusalem or Caesarea or Rome or something like that. But, but Nazareth, what good ever came out of Nazareth? That's like saying that the Messiah is going to come from Barstow. That was a joke. Sorry for those who come from Barstow. And Bethlehem, yes, it was the city of David, but David didn't spend his life there. It was a one-stop town. And that's why the word in in verse 7 is really a misnomer. It wasn't an inn. They didn't have a Holiday Inn or a Motel 6 in Bethlehem. It's actually more like a home, a home that all the family would have come and gathered in. But it says that there was no place for them in the inn. Well, why wasn't there any place for them in the inn? I mean, this is a home where all the family would have slept, and then they have the place where the animals would have been next to that. But Mary and Joseph are out with the animals. Why was there no place for them? 
in a culture where Jews were known for their hospitality, we'll make room for you. How could there be no room for them? Was it because Mary was pregnant? Was it because she was pregnant out of wedlock? The text doesn't say. But I wonder, I wonder if Mary and Joseph felt blessed in that moment. Elizabeth had said, just a chapter before, blessed are you among women. I wonder if Mary felt blessed when she was having her firstborn son with the animals and had to lay him in a feeding trough. I wonder if she felt blessed when she was marginalized by her, their family. I wonder if they felt blessed then. And yet, that's where God appears to them. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Would you ever expect to find God there? The holidays are coming. Some of you can't wait for the semester to end, but you are dreading going home. Because home for you is not home. It's a place of dysfunction and conflict and unease, where you feel marginalized and misunderstood. Would you ever expect to find God there? Would you ever expect to find God in your relational conflict with your roommate? Would you ever expect to find God in your loneliness, in your isolation, in your poverty? Because that's where God appears. Blessed are the poor, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom. He appears, he meets Mary and Joseph in their poverty just like he met the shepherds. Look in verse 8. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, shepherding, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a despised trade, but it wasn't an envious one either. Because shepherds, well, they didn't make a lot of money. It was hard work, and you had to work overtime and even through the night, like they're doing here. And yet, verse 9 says that the angel of the Lord appears to them, to shepherds. Not to Caesar, not to the governor, characters that have long dropped out of the narrative, but to shepherds. Blue-collar shepherds. What does it look like to be loved by God? What does it look like to be cared for by God? What does it look like to experience His grace and favor in your life? Does it look like power and prestige, privilege and pedigree? Not for the shepherds. It looked like working overtime. It looked like a blue-collar job. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not, has, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? James 2, 5. And notice when God chooses to reveal himself to the shepherds. Verse 8 tells us that they were keeping watch over their flock by night. In other words, he reveals himself to the shepherds when they were at work. Now, for most of us, I think work is the last place we expect to find God. Right? I mean, work is that secular sphere for some of us where, you know, we're in control and God doesn't really care. Uh, for others of us, work is, that, um, work is that place of deep shame where we can never do enough or be enough. It's like... Me in biology class. It was so difficult. And I was not going to meet God in biology class. At least so I thought. Or maybe work is just that place of distraction. I've talked to several of you. You said like since coming to school. There's just so much coursework. And so many things going on. And I just, I can't meet God. I can't have communion with him. It's been very difficult because all that's going on. For others of you, you've told me, I can't, I can't uh, study for your test because I just need to commune with God. I get it. 
But God appears to them at work. And it's actually a pattern for God. He appears to Moses when he's out herding. He appears to Gideon when he's threshing. He appears to Elisha when he's plowing. God appears to people right there in the middle of their work, just like he does to the shepherds. So listen to me. Your curse, course work... Yeah, cur- curse work. <laughs> I know that's how you feel. It's not curse work. Your coursework is not a barrier to your communion with God. Your future medical professionals, the franticness of the ER is not a barrier to your communion with God. Future business owners, uh, your managerial problems are not a barrier to your communion with God. Uh, Administrators, your meetings are not a barrier to your communion with God. New teachers, course preps and your new preps are not a barrier to your communion with God. God meets us at work. See, maybe God wants to meet us not just in the sanctuary or on the mountaintop, but in the library and in the lab. And maybe that's where he wants to meet us most. God appears to them at work. He also appears to them in the darkness. Did you notice that? Now, this may not be grammatical, historical exegesis, but it is theological exegesis. And I think it's actually quite important. Considering the symbolic resonance of light and darkness in all the birth narratives of Jesus and in the predictions about it, I don't think it's insignificant when verse 8 says that they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And then the glory appears. Notice that the light shines in the darkness. The light does not replace the darkness. The glory shines around them, but it shines around them at night. It is not light instead of darkness. It is light in the midst of darkness. The Messiah, he was supposed to come and he was supposed to put an end to poverty, to loss, to loneliness. He was supposed to put an end to crucifixion. And yet the Messiah comes and the shepherds are still poor. The Messiah comes, and Jews are still terrorized. Herod will slaughter the innocents, and Jews are still crucified. The Messiah comes, and later we find that a sword will pierce Mary's heart. You know... Maybe... God being with them didn't mean an end to their poverty and pain. Maybe God appearing and showing up meant God's peace and presence in the midst of poverty and pain and suffering and hardship. In Isaiah 63, 9, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, it says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the Lord delivered them out of them all. Nothing changes, yet everything changes. You know, we're tempted to think God's going to change our circumstances. And that's what blessing looks like. But maybe it doesn't. But we need a sign. We need a wonder. And what sign does he give? He gives them this sign. Verses 12 and uh, uh, 10 through 12. And the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. What will be the sign? What is the sign? You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. This is the sign. A newborn baby. Radiant beams from thy holy face. No. That's not what newborn babies look like. <laughs> I hate to tell you, I saw a newborn baby once. It was my daughter. I almost passed out. Literally, the nurses were like, sit down, okay? Get out of here. 
What do newborn babies look like? How do they appear? Well, they're bruised and bloody. They're covered in body fluid. They're held and helpless and they're gasping for breath and crying out in agony. And and did you know that those fluids that are associated with procreation in the Jewish Bible, it says that those make you unclean? And those places that have to do with procreation, those are the places that we cover because that's where we hide our deepest symbolic shame. And yet, where did God appear to Mary and Joseph? In their uncleanness and in their shame. You know, shame, some of the you feel deep shame about your life. And we tend to run from those places of shame, but maybe God wants to meet you there. And isn't that where you initially met God? Isn't that where you initially knew that he was with you and he was for you and he loved you? I mean, wasn't it in your place of greatest shame? And what did he look like? Wasn't he blue and bruised, covered in body fluid and bloody, held and helpless, gasping for breath, and crying out in God-forsaken agony? And then you knew that God was with you. That he was for you. And that he loved you. But you say, wait, he, the Messiah, he was supposed to crush the Gentiles. He was supposed to break them to pieces and he was supposed to do it with a cross. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. That's how he broke my heart. That's how he broke the Roman centurion's heart. Isn't that how he breaks your heart too? And subdues your will and woos you to himself. So maybe it's weakness in strength. Maybe it's light in the darkness. Maybe it's in the greatest cry of God forsakenness that the world has ever known that God was with us and for us and loved us in the deepest way we could ever feel. This is our God. There is no other. And so, as you look for him to work in your life, maybe look for him in the places that you would never expect. Because that's exactly where God shows up. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace, now and forever. Amen.